When I was 17 years old, I had um, a family move into our neighborhood and build a passive solar house. Now, passive solar means it heats and cools itself. It doesn't say it's got photovoltaic cells on the roof. So they built this passive solar house and I was just totally enthralled with learning as much as I could about it. They made a ton of mistakes on the house. Knowing what I know now, I wonder if it ever worked. I went on my mission, left home a year later. I have no idea whether it really worked. But it got me interested. So for the next 40 plus years, I looked and looked and looked to buy a passive solar home. Could never find one. And so... Would people advertise their house as that if they put it up with a realtor? Uh, most people really don't understand what passive solar means. And so my effort today is to say, this is what it really means. Here's the principles, and this is why every home that's built in the future should be passive solar. And I wish I'd thrown in one more picture. 2,500 years ago plus, Native Americans, Native Peruans, the natives learned these principles. They were building in cliff edges back in the cliff on the south side so that when the sun was right in the winter, they had a warm house in the cliff. And when the sun was high in the summer, they had a cool house in the cliff. They understood the principles. So this is not new stuff. It's not hard to understand stuff. It does take a little bit of diligence in the application to make it work properly. Um, and what it does is it designs for extremely low energy use. I'll mention just um, our own application. And of course, Len is familiar with my putting now active solar or photovoltaic cells on the roof. I've had the capability for the entire six years we have been in the house, but it takes time to do everything, and so it got put off. But there was no reason to put um, an electrical replacement on my roof because I'm only paying $40 a month for electricity. And that's not trying to save electricity, that's using as much electricity as we need. And so the design makes it extremely low energy use. The sun heats it, the ground cools it, we're always comfortable. I'll show a picture in a minute. Um, the question you ask, Clark, can the home you're in now be made over to achieve it? Well, let's take a look because it depends on the home a little bit and what you're willing to invest into the change on whether we can do it completely. I've modified a few homes partially so that it could be more comfortable and save energy. Um, just quick look and then I'm going to jump to the principles. Retrofit of existing homes, the first critical key is increase your insulation and seal the envelope. You cannot have air blowing through every gap in a window and every gap in a door and expect to have a more comfortable home. It's just not possible. And so it's got to have a sealed envelope. And I'll show in the next slide the walls and the floor and the roof need insulation. We can't ignore any of those uh, if we want to have a truly comfortable home. One of the homes we were in really didn't have a lot of other options, but I still built a sunroom on the south side and so that we had a very warm room on the south side during the summer or during the winter and I could open the windows to a living room off that sunroom and gain the heat from that. So there's other principles that will work. Um, so let's take a look at the principles. First, we've got to work with the sun and the earth and the wind to provide the heat and the cool. I mentioned the full insulation of the walls under the floor and in the roof to about an R50 is, is roughly the magic number. Any higher than that, it doesn't seem to make any difference. You go down to about 30 and it seems like you're really not getting enough insulation to, to really hold that temperature. Add thermal mass. 
Um, probably ought to define thermal mass because this picture shows a little bit and this picture is bigger on the next screen. But this house and my house, my major thermal mass is my slab. And I've got a nine inch thermal mass in my floor. That much thermal mass means I can go two weeks without the house cooling off any more than about five degrees. So we had 10 degrees overnight per a day, a night or two here. What's it been, a week or two ago? 10 degrees outside. We woke up to 68 in the bedroom we were sleeping because we're in the second floor without a, a, a thermal mass in any of us. It was still 70 degrees on the main floor and 10 degrees outside because that thermal mass is radiating its temperature back up into the room all night long. And it takes weeks to wear out that thermal mass radiance if there's enough thermal mass, and that's the key. And then your glazing, your windows, have to be managed on the walls and be very insulated. And I'll talk about that principle more in just a second. Let's get to a little bit bigger picture. No, I, I want to just show the picture before I... All right, I'll talk to this and we'll get to the picture. Our You're home... This all happens without adding any heat of your own. No furnace, no fireplace. There is no furnace in the house and there's no air conditioner in the house. It's designed completely without ducted air flow. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, in the winter, we stay between 69 and 74. 69 is the coldest it's... I, I take that back. After two weeks of no sun, we did get to 67 overnight, um, just a day or two. But typical, our typical cold and typical flow, it stays between 69 and 74 in the, in the day with the sun shining in and 69 overnight. Um, and that is 10 degrees or seven degrees at night all the way up to whatever we get to, 50, 60 here occasionally uh, in the winter. And then in the summer, it stays between roughly 72 and 78, which is where I prefer my thermostat to be set in the summer. Um, and the temperatures outside from, I don't know, what do we see, 110, 115 sometimes? And then our cool nights are maybe 40s at the coolest. In the summer? In the summer. Well, actual summer, midsummer, we stay a little above 80 once in a while, don't we? <laughs> Some nights are warm. Not complaining, just saying they are warm sometimes. Yeah. On those times when it stays above 80 for any more than three or four days in a row, I do have to throw in a swamp cooler if I want to stay cool. Um, because the house can only keep it cool as long as that slab hasn't been heated up. And if it's <clears throat> over 80 outside, I have no opportunity to cool off the slab again. Is your nine inches the perfect, or would it be better if you had like 12 inches or 15 um, inches? Most slabs are only a five inch slab or six. I added three inches of dirt underneath and then two inches of insulation underneath the dirt. So I started with insulation, just a two inch foam, put three inches of dirt on it, put the rebar and stuff on top of that and poured the, poured the slab. Uh, it was a five inch slab and then we put another three quarters to an inch of, it has to be something that will let the heat drive in and radiate back out. So our floors are actually a tile floor and any tile color will do, but black or, or dark brown or whatever tiles will soak it in faster. So we went with wood tile because we wanted wood floors, but you can't have wood floors if you want to soak the heat into the thermal mass, at least in the place where the sun hits. The sun has to have a way of soaking into that thermal mass. Um, so the rest of the floor could have been anything, but that eight or 12 feet where the sun's hitting from the windows had to be uh, something that would draw it in quickly. Um, there is no air blowing period. I don't have anything. Uh, my upstairs office that gets a couple of degrees warmer than anywhere else in the middle of summer because it's on an end wall. Uh, 
I'll throw a tower pan or something quiet on me. Um, how to manage it. And then we'll look at some pictures and actually talk about this. Winter, every night I go through and close the thermal curtains on those windows and every morning I open them up because the sun is going to pour in those windows all day long and be stored in this in the floor in the thermal mass. In the summer, as long as it's below a temperature that makes sense, 75 or something like that, we open the windows and let the cool air blow through, cool off the whole house, close it back up during the day and it holds the temperature because the thermal mass of that floor holds it. And then I mentioned swamp coolers if it stays over 80. We used just one book and then my efforts run out the house, feed my father-in-law, pack the truck and everything else. I forgot to grab the book so I could pass it around, but this is the only book I used. And it's called The Solar House. It talks about sun solar, not, not photogalactic, electric solar. And he did a beautiful job of providing pictures, 10 times more than I'll show you today, and exact calculations of how big your windows need to be and so forth. This room that he's showing is a sunroom. That is not a regular room. If that was a south and west room, you would have nothing but overheating in that room all day long. You cannot have that many windows on the south room in the winter. And the, the rule is something in the 7% range of the wall space, or of the square foot of the floor. And they're probably pushing 12 or 15 percent, double or triple. That's a sunroom, and it does have opening windows and stuff. They probably like the picture because it showed that you're using the sun. <laughs> the home we're in now is the most comfortable home we've ever been in. If we ever had to move, we would, both of us have agreed, we'd have to design and build another one. And it has to be built for the site, the location, the latitude, the longitude, it's got to be oriented the right direction. There are a few things that matter. But I will say, lastly, the principles are forgiving. I made a couple of mistakes because this is the first home we've ever built, one. The first home we've ever designed. <laughs> I did all my own design work. We didn't have an architect. We didn't have anybody check my math, my plans. I couldn't find anybody that was willing to do it. The draftsman next time they'll do it. <laughs> The, um, the only person that would give me a quote up from a lady in Salt Lake wanted $36,000 to check my plans. And I said, are you crazy? I need three hours of your work to check my math and make sure that my orientations and everything are right. And you want to charge me $36,000? I said, no, thank you. Uh, we'll just build it and we'll see, <laughs> see how it goes. Uh, and it worked. So the, the principles are forgiving. You don't have to be exacting on the principles. Principles then, let's jump into them. The sun may be our servant or it may make you exceedingly uncomfortable. If you make too many windows, you'll be uncomfortable. If you have west facing windows that are open to that sun, it will bake you in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And, and that's all it takes to know. In fact, it's worth, in, if you're in a house right now with tons of west-facing windows, take them all out and block it up and reduce the west-facing windows. Because the, it, what do you need for view and what do you need for sunlight? We've got a room on the west. We have a, four, a three by three window on it and it's plenty for view and plenty for sunlight. And it doesn't overheat the room. <laughs> Uh, which way is south? Think of your home. Which way? Yeah, that way south. In your home, is your south view unobstructed? We don't have a view on the south side. Our, our house faces west. Do you have the capability of having windows on the south is really your critical question um, because that's your heating direction uh, in the winter. And, and so then in the summer, you've got to have an overhang on south facing windows. For our house, that 
uh, the first floor is 10 feet to the roof line and all I needed was a four foot overhang and it worked wonderfully to shield those windows completely mid spring, all of summer, mid fall and the, the windows are shielded with that four foot overhang. Then mid fall, all the way through the winter to mid spring, the sun is shining in and warming it up from the cool nights and, and from the cold in the winter it's shining straight in. I'll show you a couple pictures to, to illustrate this. Color of roof makes a difference. Which color roof is going to bring the heat in in the summer? Black. Dark. Black. Dark. How many of you drive white cars? Well, silver. Silver. Okay. Well, I wouldn't want a white one, so I bought a white truck. Yeah. And I, I'm not a racist, though. I've decided I will never buy in southern Utah a black vehicle. You step in it, go to Walmart, step in 30 minutes later, it's 140 degrees in there. Uh, even a white one has a hard time fighting it off very long, but at least it fights it off for roughly two or three times. A white roof, if you've noticed our house, we put a white roof on that house and it's a metal roof. It just kicks the sun right back out again in the summer and we don't have to fight that temperature difference. Why does everybody put black tile and black shingles on the roof around here? They don't understand the principles. Yeah. My house had white shingles until I moved here and had red tile, but I always put white shingles on the house. Uh, a lot of the tiles, it doesn't matter a ton what color they are because you've got a gap yeah. where the air is flowing. Uh, and then if you've got it well enough insulated, it doesn't build up heat. But shingles, suck it in. <laughs> Pull that temperature right in with black shingles and hope you can insulate your attic enough to try and block that 140 degree raising it. I don't know, have you ever climbed in an attic with black shingles in the middle of the day? Sauna. 180, 190 degrees, 200 degrees. Yeah, you can't work up there. My entire envelope is insulated with 10 inches of blown foam. Uh, uh, not, it, it's the expandable foam, the kind that you blow in there and it goes whoosh. That 10 inches, I can go anywhere in the attic space, pull wires, adjust plumbing, whatever. I don't feel any different than I do in the middle of the house. It's still 75 degrees or 72 degrees or whatever. And so I can work in those crawl spaces up in the attic all day long because that's the way it's designed. Um, speaking of insulation in attic and walls, the R50, my roof line is probably closer to an R40 with that 10 inches. Um, and the walls are a foot thick up to 10 feet with... Your exterior walls are all a foot thick. All a foot thick. What are they made of, cement? I'll show that in a second in a slide. Um, it's insulated concrete forms. So they are cement up to the 10 foot roof line level. Yes. Let's stop at 50 cal. Say again. No. So yes, it would stop anything really. It'll stop. The other benefit of the right design is it's completely a non-burnable design. Ours is concrete exterior concrete lat siding, metal roof, it, it doesn't burn. You can have a forest fire rip right through and it, it can't catch on fire. So you didn't evacuate when they had that fire coming up from uh, Winchester. Yeah, I didn't you worry about it. You stood out and laughed and yeah. went to bed? Didn't worry about it because <laughs> there's nothing that can burn on that house. It was a smell, it was a strong smell to be <laughs> outside. Yeah. All right, let's take a look at pictures. This is a little helpful. Um, summer sun, let's talk about sun first. Summer sun is actually here, higher than that. It goes almost straight overhead, doesn't it? And then in the winter, we're at 37 degrees for the winter sun. And so it shoots in the house a long ways. Um, so that's the first really big thing is sun angle makes the biggest difference on whether you can apply this to your home or not. The principles work on a greenhouse, a chicken house, 
a shed. I built my tractor shed with the same principles so that I didn't have to have a cold tractor shed if I want to work on my tractor in the winter. I don't have to heat it, it's just got the sun shining in and I couldn't, it's not insulated yet, but it's comfortable during the day because the sun shines in during the winter. Um, next, yeah, the shading. The shading really ought to be just the tiniest bit more than what they're showing there because you shouldn't be heating up your wall either. You don't want it touching the wall and heating the wall up while in the summer. Continuous envelope coverage and insulation makes all the difference in the world. All the way around all the corners, seal the door cracks, seal the window cracks, all of that makes a difference. So that's insulation above. I didn't go this way with insulation, I went roof line because that was available. He could spray it in on the roof line before we had put all of the... You got metal trusses? No, it's, it is wood truss because the metal trusses weren't economical uh, at that time. My guess right now, with wood as high as it is, metal would be economical. <laughs> Uh, six years ago, the prices were going up as we were building. We paid about 20% more than the quoted amount was. And because we could only get a loan for the quoted amount, we, we pulled everything out of savings. We put every dime we made for that whole six months into it. Um, but we managed to still get it built. <laughs> One way to calculate how much you've got that overhang there's a formula that's on, a, on your phone if you've got a smartphone, and you can calculate the angle of the sun in the winter. You pick the day like the 21st of December, which is the solstice, shortest day of the month, or year I mean, and you put like a pole. It doesn't matter as long as you got like six feet, four feet, whatever. You put in this pole and then measure the length of the shadow. Uh -huh. And then you put this into this calculation app on your phone, and it'll tell you the exact angle of the sun. And that's your average angle through the winter. It'll get a little less as we get closer towards spring and, you know, same with yeah. fall, but in the, in the height of the winter time. And that'll tell you the angle of the sun so you can make it so you've got your roof hanging out just far enough to keep the sun coming in, but, you know, avoiding the summer sun. Yes. It, it makes it pretty precise. It's all on a freaking app. I did that when I built my greenhouse. Oh, yeah. I put the angle of the roof on the greenhouse facing south so it would be perpendicular to the sun in the summertime. Yep. But then in the winter, or in the summer, the sun's up high and it reflects it, but in the wintertime it's perpendicular to the sun, so I got the most heat. And brings it straight in. And if you take a look at my greenhouse, I did the exact same thing. It's, it's got um, all those angles right, and it never freezes because it's dropped in three foot into the earth. Uh, it needs a little a bit more insulation on a couple of the areas. And I'll get that done this year. And, and Buy those cans of that great stuff. It comes in a can, you spray it, and it goes in like a liquid foam, and then it hardens as it expands. That'll plug up all your holes, vents, works really good. Uh -huh. I've had my greenhouse in now about five years, and the foam that I sprayed is still good. So, insulation. We talked about the thermal mass. You gotta have insulation underneath that thermal mass, don't you? Because where's our biggest challenge with heat change? In the summer, it may not be such a challenge, but in the winter, that ground actually does cool off a, a bit. And then when the slab is sitting on that ground, you've got a constantly cold slab, and you're trying to heat the first five feet of ground below you to heat your home. Well, if you built a basement, you've gone down, say, eight feet into the basement, would you still need that foam? Because once you get below four feet, supposedly you get the heat from the Earth's surface. They call it thermal heating or whatever, below four feet. How many of you have basements or cellars? What temperature does your basement hold right now? Oh, well, right now with no heat down there, it's probably gonna be around 65. Okay. That's in the winter and the summer. Yeah. It's usually right around uh, 70, which is quite comfortable. 64, 65. Yeah. Yours? Yeah, in the 60s. Mine holds 68 year round. It is so annoying. You have a basement? 
we have a, a small cellar. I'll show it in the frame. And you put that uh, foam down there. I didn't put the foam underneath the cellar purposely because I wanted the cellar to be the temperature of the ground. And everybody said, ground temperature is 55 once you get below 10 feet. 68 degrees yeah. year round. <laughs> Going, that didn't help. I don't have a 55 degree root cellar for my potatoes. <laughs> but it doesn't temperature swing. And so it's still a good cellar. But yeah, the, that's helpful. And then the glazing, we won't, we'll talk more about that in just a minute. But um, that is also a principle that makes a difference. Uh, you've already talked about most of these. I just want to show a little uh, different design. So in the winter, the sun's coming in, the flare story windows and these windows, and heating up the entire house. And in the summer, there's enough overhang to block it. And then they just open uh, windows and let the air flow through so that it makes for, for a full comfort summer and winter. I think we've He's got a brother-in-law. Your brother-in-law lives just down the street from you. Um, I forget his name. He's Glenn. Glenn. What is it? Glenn. Glenn. Their whole house is south facing and it's got all that glass. Did he do it for that purpose? Did it make I it a think so. passive, passive solar house? Does it overheat? You know, I don't know. I haven't asked. <clears throat> huh. I'm not sure which house that is, but the one that I'm thinking of it has all the glass. It's got to overheat. That much glass on the south side. It's just a little bit about four or five houses west of where Clark here lives. Okay. If you know where Clark lives. It's on the hill and it's way back in. Lots yeah, of faces property south. in front. Is it like orange? Orange, yeah. That's what I'm thinking about. Yes. Yeah. That almost from has east. to overheat on the right. second floor. Yeah, just just looking at the design and going, oh wow, they really really went 100% on windows on that south side. If you, well, I'll show you in a minute. My house just doesn't have what looks like a lot of windows. Is that your phone? Yeah. Oh. Um, R50 Plus, I mentioned that already. Uh, we only spend about $10,000 on insulation on a $400,000 home. So almost nothing really different than what you would spend, but it has to be the right style of insulation. Was it less expensive to make your home out of concrete versus the wood and the framing and the, all that? Was it actually cheaper? It, um, the Fox blocks, the entire exterior Fox block was $37,000 and then concrete down it, which I didn't run those numbers. I still got all the receipts, but I didn't run the numbers as we went. But the total cost of the home was estimated at roughly the same per square foot as any other building at that time. And so we probably paid five or 6% more than the average person, but we also insisted on solid core doors and solid cabinets. And, you know, we put quality in everything. And if the builder says, you're running out of money, you need to put cheap cabinets and cheap doors in your, your last step. And I says, absolutely not. We're not making a home for comfort and then cheapening it. So I have to build, spend money every year trying to maintain it. That's not happening. <laughs> um, okay. Insulation, we've talked about, the, about that plenty. Um, even this article said the average cost of home insulation is between $3,000 and $10,000. This is last year for a 2,000-square-foot home. Um, return on investment for me, we've already got back all of the cost of that insulation in no electric bill. So, you just put the insulation one in the floor and then in the ceiling. Underneath. Because you've got thick walls. Mm -hmm. This is Fox Blocks. You may have seen these. They're kind of like Lego, stackable Legos. Um, and you can see these little knobs on them. You just stack them on top of each other. They have corners, inside and outside corners, and places for the rebar to, to sit. And it doesn't take skilled labor to put it together. You Is that what you did? Yeah. Uh, now, the guy that's done 
Fox block building. What's it called? Say it again. Insulated concrete forms is the generic term, and there's five or six different companies that build them. Fox block. F O X B L O X. Oh. Um, but the insulated concrete form is the generic term, and there's actually three other homes here in the valley that are built out of insulated concrete. And you would never know it. Looking at them, you would never know that it's a difference. You leave that up after you pour the concrete, or do you take it off? Yeah, no, it's it changed. insulation. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah, uh, that's oh, wow. about three inches, two and three quarter inches on each side of insulation, and then a six inch pour in the middle of it. And then on the, do that on the other one? Yes, I do. I'll show you the, the whole wall. And then, the biggest principle here is make sure there's not an opportunity for thermal bridging. Typical um, wood construction, wood is not a super good insulator. And so it's cold out here and you've got a wood stud here, you're going to bridge that cold right to the inside. And so uh, if I thought about it, they do a design where you don't touch the studs to each other. You have an outside and an inside, and then every other one doesn't quite touch, so there's no thermal bridge to go between all the way. Um, that was my other option. I was going to make eight inch walls with just not bridging the, the gap there, which is a lot more expensive. I think if I built that. When you say eight inch walls, is it eight inches of concrete or it's eight inches including these it, it insulated would've. concrete forms? Um, if I had to build eight inch studded walls, eight inch wood frame walls, there would have been no concrete at all. Then I would have had to do a blown insulation. But is your house eight inches of concrete? It's six inches of concrete. Okay. And about three, if I can round it, three inches here and three inches here of insulation. And then on the oh. inside is just drywall. Screwed on like normal. On the outside, we chose to go with a concrete hardy board, lat board siding. So it's actually concrete with through green. It's green all the way through it. So if it gets a little nick in it, you can't tell that there's a nick in it because it's the same color all the way through. And never needs painted, no maintenance. The roof's 40 years, no maintenance. And that was part of the design. We wanted to make sure we weren't getting old and spending half our time trying to maintain a, a home. Because um, building a home in your 60s and thinking you're going to spend the rest of your life there is that you really don't want to be spending hours and Okay, work. so question, electrical boxes. You cut them into the insulation before you pour the concrete. Um, so if it's in the wall, like the base there, that insulation is so easy to route. All they do is they take a hot knife and um, it's a hot curve, and they just run it along the wall and pop conduit in it and run the wire through it. It's extremely fast to drop the wiring into this style of, of building, if they understand what they're doing. Uh, and you're plumbing. You're plumbing. You're sewing. Plumbing, the same thing. We did very limited plumbing on the outside wall, just the outside spigots. And ran them down the inside wall so that they're inside completely thermally insulated from the outside and then just pop them through so that the only part that's exposed to the cold is that last inch. Oh. Do you heat with, I mean, do you have electric to cook or are you all gas or? Uh, we're gas dryer, gas cooking, um, gas water heaters. And so the gas bill is about $40 a month also. Uh, I know people have gone all electric. Their bills are still less than $100 a month for all electric cooking and, and drying and stuff, water heating. Which you can 
Well, was the purpose of this presentation tonight to make us all feel bad because we don't have a house like that? You can change <laughs> some I things. I have southern windows. You can change <laughs> some things, and all you've got to do is make sure that the other principles are as tight as you can get them, and then it increases your comfort. Because this is a preparedness concept group of classes, really the key is what can I do to stay alive if we have no electricity? And this design principles, if you can get it, yes, it's going to lower your power bill right now, but it's also going to lengthen the amount of time you got between having no electricity and staying comfortable. I know some of our homes, if the electricity's off for an hour and a half, the home starts getting uncomfortable. I've been in those homes and I'm going, whoa, it's 10 degrees outside and the wind's blowing and this house feels like it's 40 inside and the furnace is blowing the whole time trying to keep it warm because there's so much air flowing through there. So blocking the airflow is probably the biggest thing that some people can do. And then just think about the principles of what happens. It may be worth replacing windows and doors, um, but, or is there ever a time when you've got to replace all your siding, then add some insulation and change it to a stucco so that the siding doesn't let the air flow through, or something like that. You know, consider the principles when you make those, those changes. You can see how the rebar is upward through this, and then wrapped on and down. It's got the channels for it, so it's an instant rebar channel, uh, the way it's built. Thermal mass, we've already talked about, I think, enough. Uh, you asked, that, is nine inches about right? Yep. I don't know. It's plenty. I'll tell you, it's plenty. One opinion I read said, don't go more than about five or six inches of thermal mass, you'll wish you hadn't. And I'm going, but the only difference is, it takes longer to change the temperature the thicker it gets. So. For example, we moved in, it was under construction in the winter. If I brought the pictures, I could show you. We were shoveling snow out of the inside of the house before the roof got up, trying to get it clean enough so that we could continue building. And so the slab was outside temperature. It took about a month of the sun shining on that slab to get it completely warmed up. But once it was warm, there's no worry. And we moved out of a trailer, so I didn't care what that slab temperature was. We were in a safe, enclosed house that we weren't living in the trailer anymore. Uh, we moved in in March. There's one other example. And you ask about supplemental heat. I will mention that with this one. Uh, you can see the winter sun shining in. Here, the summer sun is blocked. They built so they can open the windows and completely flow the air through. That's a critical principle. Take a look at this one. They're using water flowing through on the roof um, and then coming down and stored in a large container here as they're heater, and then they're running that through pipes and floor. We took the idea, and my wife said, I am not going to have water running through my floor. A concrete floor, if you get a broken pipe or anything in it, it's nothing but a mess. And I remember having the conversation, we were driving that day, and she says, not going to happen. I says, we've got to do something for supplemental if we really need it. If it's two or three weeks of no sun, you got to have some way of heating. And she says, not in the floor. I'm not walking on a cold floor because we're trying to cool with pipes in the floor, and I'm not walking on a hot floor or because we're trying to heat with pipes in the floor. It wouldn't have happened, but the, we decided to put it in the walls. And so our walls upstairs, the interior walls, have... Uh, hex piping running through them that we just simply throw uh, 
it's got a thermostat in there. It opens up a, a valve, lets the water run through, and in about three hours, it'll change the temperature in the room up five degrees. Now it's really slow compared to a furnace blowing on it, but it's a really gentle heat because um, thermal principles say if there's hot air here, the air is gonna rise, it's gonna go across, drop, and it's gonna move itself, isn't it? And so that's the principle they used on this one um, to do the same thing. You can play with design principles like you did in your greenhouse, because this probably is about your greenhouse design angles, isn't it? By 32 degrees. 32, and I made mine 37 degrees. Um, and then the back wall on mine, I don't have glass on, it's metal. So the two thirds of my greenhouse is glass and the north third is metal. Mine's too. Okay. Just that corrugated sheet metal on the north side. Yeah. It runs east and west, so roof like this, south side and a north side. Yeah, same, same That's design. insulation on the inside against the metal. And I need to, that's what I'm missing. I've got wood underneath the metal, but I don't have insulation. And that's my only weak spot right now. I've got to insulate the, the north side. Um, and it stabilizes the temperature in there. It never freezes, but it comes really close when it gets down at 10 degrees. <laughs> mine gets too hot in the summer for mine. I was thinking of ways to cool it. Some people say, oh, put a swamp cooler down there. How much thermal mass do you have? I, I bought a swamp cooler for that reason, but last year I had enough thermal mass, it never overheated either. How much thermal mass? thought, I got eight inch thick reinforced concrete on the walls all the way to four sides. And then the roof sits on top, it's eight feet in the ground. So the roof comes almost to the surface of the earth. Okay, so you're, your earth and your wall should be enough thermal mass to pull that heat out of it, but I... It's just, it's got the sun beating down on it in the summer. I've seen these things advertised. Uh, they're circular and they're powered by the sun. They're solar powered exhaust fans. Yeah. And will suck the air out because all the heat does rise, of course. And then, yeah. uh, I thought that might work. Put a huge uh, opening at the east end where the shutters will open and it's got a big fan in there, oversized fan for the size. It's 40 feet by 20 feet, mm -hmm. and I got a fan that was like twice the size needed, and then the other side just got shutters, and it's hooked up to a temperature gauge so that when it gets above a certain temp, the fan automatically turns on, and it'll run almost all day long in the summer, just trying to suck all that heat out of there, but it's working against the sun, and the sun wins. So I thought, well, if I installed these things, I don't know if you've ever used them, or. I have it, but there's a couple of things here that have those, and I know they work, so. Who? Um, his name is Stephen Williams, and they live in the log home on Emerald. On I see the log home down this way. Is that very big log home? I, no, it's, it's uh, if you go over to, we're on Sapphire, go over to Diamond Valley, Emerald takes off and goes up the hill that way. They're on the south side of Emerald in the, and then they've got a, um, underground cellar, I guess you could call it, with those kind of turbines on top of it. Oh, that just he, ask him where he got his, huh? Well, they're second or third owners, so. Oh. But I'm sure you can find them online if you. I found online, just how yeah. to hook them up to the, to the corrugated metal on the north side. Uh-huh. It won't have some sort of a fit. You can buy that uh, foam, that black foam that is shaped like the uh, corrugated metal. I thought I could try that, I just haven't uh, yeah. done it yet. Another example, I'm not gonna spend any time on these examples, the winter sun shining clear in, and the summer, uh, or winter night, balancing it back out again. Summer sun is blot, or summer night, blow it through, cool it off. Summer sun is blocked during the summer. So. Lots of different principles work. It doesn't matter what your design is, it just matters that you apply the principles to it. Is that representations of homes? Or? Yes, yeah, okay. different people are building this way. It probably wouldn't be how I build it. They had a, a hill and they decided to build a, a split level passive solar on it. So.
the glazing principle I want to talk to you for a minute because this home, I picked that picture because it's overheated all the time. There is too much window, <laughs> just 10 times too much. It's hot all summer and all winter. It's just too hot. And that's one of the things you have to make sure you actually think about is you just don't overdo some, <laughs> a little window is maybe too little. The right amount's perfect. Too much is just gonna mean you've got your windows open all winter long and you're suffering like crazy in the summer, especially here in Southern Utah. Um, you've already mentioned it with your greenhouse. Your oriented long wall is east and west. East and west. Catch the maximum sun in the winter time. Yep. And and then the windows then. Uh, I said south wall, that should be actually 7% of south wall, 7% of your total square footage on your main floor is windows on the south wall. I should have flipped the wording there. North and west, very small windows, 1 or 2% of your total square footage. And then east might be 3 or 4%, but don't go too much higher than that because you'll actually heat up too fast as the sun's coming up. And those um, numbers are in the book that I referenced at the very beginning. This picture is not a picture. This is my um, concept design of my home south wall. So that was my concept of putting uh, panels on the roof. Those weren't on there until this year. <laughs> and they're still not quite hooked up. I started the wiring last weekend. But look how much window there is, and the house stops here, and the garage starts here. I've got a cellar underneath the house, a door, and two walls in the garage. The garage actually is built on the same principle, so the garage maintains a completely comfortable temperature year-round also. So what does that look like? Maybe a third of the back wall, the south wall, is windows and doors. Got a, a sliding glass door in it also. Um, but that's 7% of my square foot of the house, of the main floor. Not going to spend any time on this, but we did design it ourselves, um, drew our own plans, got them approved, got all the permits. So it's not impossible for something com someone completely unfamiliar with the permitting process in the county, with how to design a home, it's not impossible to do it yourself. Um, we did a lot of playing, a lot of discussion, and one or two things we missed, I can say that. This is the master bedroom. My wife would love to have a bigger walk-in closet. We did a walk-through bathroom, uh, toilet room here so that we could share the entryway if we had guests. So our master toilet has a, a door on this end and a door on this end. She hates it. She wants a private toilet. We should have designed it that way to begin with. Could have easily designed Just it. Just always keep that one door locked. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's by your entrance. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and, and no big deal, but occasionally- Try wallet in. If there's guests, and we'll at some point we'll spend ten thousand dollars and put in a second toilet, put a wall in between, and you know we'll do some design changes. But overall, the home is totally comfortable. This is main floor design. The upstairs has two bedrooms, a bathroom, and a bonus room over the garage. Um, so it's a three-bedroom home with a bonus room, and just comfortable year-round. That's the front concept. See that's white sheet metal on top. Yep. Raised seam roof. Um, um, this picture, and it's hard to see, but that sky above those walls, that is just before the roof went on. Um, that's the front side of the house. You can see how few windows there are on the north side. One bathroom window, a door that's very well insulated, 
garage from those, you, there's one window in the kitchen right now, I need it. And that is the Fox blocks all stacked up, ready to, ready to go there. That's what it looks like today with the um, front is all natural flowers, just wildflowers in the summer. They like Mona Lana. The, you got it. <laughs> I told my wife I am not mowing the lawn. Period. I am not going to tie myself to lawn mowing every single week. There's no Most things are desert scapes, so they take minimal water. Um, these wildflowers were purposely designed for our area so that they don't take a lot of water, and then they just reseed year after year. They've done it each year. Uh, this is very, very early before other things built in. And then if you can see it behind us now, there's other colors um, later on in the spring and summer. <clears throat> Looks nice. There is an example that I posted on Facebook one year. The outside temperature was 101. I don't know if you can see it in that one. My, my screen, I can see it. I'm not straight on to it. Yeah. Uh, one percent humidity, seventy-four inside temperature. Oh. The laser gun pointed at the floor, which is our thermal mass, was measuring the floor temperature at sixty-eight point nine degrees. So it's like cool. That would be, you know, more than just being. <laughs> Fun. It, it really is cool. Yeah. So 101 outside and 72 was the air temperature inside. 74, I guess. That the floor was actually 68 degrees, 68.9, 69 degrees, keeping that 74 degrees at 74. So when we walk around in barefoot or stocking feet, our feet are cool, <laughs> and the outside temperature is over 100. I'm not going to spend time on that. That's another passive solar design plan. Um, just a quick review of the principles. Just like you did with your greenhouse, pay attention to the sun and the earth. It works. It just works. That's the key. Insulation is critical. You've got your greenhouse insulated properly. I don't yet. It's got to have a little bit more insulation to work properly. The house does. The greenhouse does not. The thermal mass I have water as my thermal mass in the greenhouse, and the air can flow around it, and as the sun's shining in, it's heating up the water, but overnight, it pushes it back out again, and so it balances the day and night temperature uh, with the water in the greenhouse. And then the glazing is the other critical key um, on that. Do you put anything like shade, that stuff you glue these film to your windows to make them like sunglasses? It is critical on a passive solar home that these south windows are not um, treated windows. Oh. You've got to have the sun and the heat of that sun coming through those south windows because they make it, uh, what's it called? I don't remember the name of it. They make a treatment that blocks the sun from coming the light comes through, but the heat yeah. ray doesn't come through. Oh. That blows the entire design of, <laughs> yeah. of, of heating up your house with the sun. So, And know that it will damage your furniture to be sitting in the direct sun. Yeah, so you don't, don't put your furniture right there. Either. You want your floor right there. Yes. And <laughs> if I were to go back to my... I tell my wife, there's a window there. Can we not put a rug on the floor blocking the sun from balancing out the temperature? I want a rug there. There's a rug there. The room heats up farther than it needs to. It gets up to 78 in that part of the room, and then it has to balance out everywhere else. <laughs> But so the rug accepts more heat? The rug blocks the sun from heat being absorbed flat. into the thermal mass, and so it's actually heating up that part of the room. Okay, yeah. And so it's 78 in that part of the room, and it's 74 in the rest of the house. And the but floor is cooler. 
Yeah, yeah because it didn't get into the floor. Right. Okay. But the principles are forgiving because it all moves around and, and it balances itself out. Resources. You mentioned resources. Um, I'll post this on the website afterwards. This guy actually is very good at design. SUSdesign.com. Um, you mentioned an app for the phone. The PV Watts app also will do those types of calculations for sun angle and and so forth when you're trying to apply it to another building. Um, and then this is a design group that actually does pretty good. I didn't find any of these before I designed it myself, or I probably would have reached out to one of these guys either in back east or, or whatever. Uh, but there are guys that are actively doing design. You don't have to do that yourself if you don't want to run all the math and, and try and figure it out. Uh, the principles work in any design. My wife wanted the house to look a little bit um, standard. And like a regular home. She wanted to look in an oddball house. Yeah. And it looks like a lot of the homes do in Diamond Valley with a couple of dormers and just whatever. It can look like anything and still work as long as the principles are, are applied. Uh, yeah. You see those geodesic homes that people built? Are they built to be a uh, passive solar? That's the round ones, right? Yeah, and they have all those triangles that fit together and it's, uh, it's like a ball. They're well insulated. They got that. If you put the windows on the south round, you could match that. Absolutely. I, we actually first designed a couple of those and I said, you know what? Let's not play with the round homes anymore. Let's go plain old flat design and it worked out. I think that's the, yep, that's the end. Very good. Yay. <laughs> Thank you for coming. It was uh,